phone call. All right. These are gorgeous, friends. These are gorgeous. So I played a little game with some of you. Here's, the, you guys showed me your sample data and said, which, do, which dice did we have? And all I had to do was, I, I got to look at your sample data and then I let my eyes scan up to the board and I could, I could decide which color dice you had. Now I wasn't looking at the graphs at all. I was looking only at the top line as my eyes went around the, the board and I could identify what dice you had. So here's what I want to ask you guys. What interesting things have happened on the board since you did this cool sampling activity, which you will then understand how I was able to do that so quickly. What, take a look, here's the orange, here's the red, here's the green, there's the blue, and Michael's over there adjusting the yellow, a little smidge, a little smidge, totally fine, man, totally fine. What do you notice about these? These are called the sampling distributions of the average. So the distributions are not the same as the original population distributions. Those were actually what could happen on each of the 36 outcomes. This is a graph of your averages that you get from your samples of size four. Mm -hmm. What's going on? Well, they look bell-shaped. Every one of them is bell-shaped. And then they're like shifted. Ish. Nice, good. So Robert said two things there, okay, one at a time, it's okay. First of all, every ish, yes. I will, I will deal with the ish, I will deal with the ish hopefully more on Thursday. Actually, definitely more on Thursday. But do you, now compare it to the original populations though. That's what I'm looking at. Compare these to the original population shapes. Okay, so here, there's the blue distribution. Here's the sampling distribution. Now compare, there's no comparison. There's no comparison. That is a skewed distribution, that's a bell shaped distribution. That's where they're different. Now they are the same in, in a way too, we'll get back to that. Okay, so there's blue. Here is, there's yellow. Yellow's over on the sideboard over here. So here's the population distribution. That's, I would call that skewed. Yeah, it's got a trailing tail off to the one side. Where'd the trailing tail go? It's gone. Why did the trailing tail disappear over here? Anybody have, any, have, have, have an idea why, why the tail's gone over there? Well, why would that make this tail go away? I like that, Jack. Because uh, it's not, it won't be as, I don't know, it won't be as, as precise. With the, lar uh, with the larger sample? But, okay, I like that, but, so you're saying it would show back up with a larger sample. Okay, good. Kate, go ahead. Well, it's because, like, if you look up on the board, one for 11, that only happened once, however, how many times your computer did it? So what I'm going to do, hold that thought, that's perfect. I'm going to tie that into Jack's comment. If we can only get an 11, one in 36 times, how hard would it be to get an average of 11 out of four rolls? Damn near impossible, because you'd have to roll the 11 essentially all four times, which means you take an extraordinarily rare roll of 11 and then replicate it three more times, which is a one in 36 to the fourth power probability which is basically zero. So my claim, Jack, we're going to see even fewer 11s with larger sample sizes because in order to have like a sample size of 10, you'd have to roll 11 10 times, which is even less likely to roll four times. So basically the idea that that tail is gone on the yellow curve is that it's too damn hard to be in the tail. You have to get into the extremes. Basically you have to keep seeing outliers. Well, that's kind of the problem. Outliers you don't see very often. If you keep seeing them, they're not outliers anymore. You see, that's kind of what I'm getting at. So that's why the tails disappear. The question, though, is why the bell will show up? We'll come back to that. Okay, next up, after yellow, we look at green. There's the green distribution on top of our, on top of our sampling distribution, so I'll, I'll mute it so you can see it. There's the sampling distribution. There's the green distribution. Tails are gone. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. Tails are gone. No twos and twelves in the averages. Same reason. It's not as excessive as the yellow curve, but in order to average a 12, essentially, you have to get... Four twelves. Well, think about the chance of that happening. There's four ways to get twelve, which is a what is that? Four and thirty-six is one and nine. To roll twelve four times is one ninth of the fourth power, which is essentially zero. You're not going to see that on average. You'll see it rarely, but not within say twenty-five samples or even seventy-five or fifty samples, like you guys saw. Beautiful. Next up, there's orange. Orange has no discernible shape whatsoever. No discernible, it's bimodal, it's got gaps. Look at orange over there. A beautiful, beautiful, almost perfect bell shape. Again, a little bit, a little, a little bit gappy. But nonetheless, compared to the original distribution, doesn't resemble it at all. Ish. And then last but not least, red. Red is probably the least surprising. There's the sampling distribution on red. 
I'm guessing it's the least surprising because remember what the red distribution looked like in the beginning? It was already bell-shaped when you started. So the question is, the first thing we notice, Robert, thank you, is all the sampling distributions are bell-shaped even if the original ones aren't. Number one, very nice. There's two other things I want you to notice now. What else do you notice about these bell shapes? What's clever about bell shapes? Why do we get so happy with them? Why do I get so happy with them? It makes sense. Easy to do standard deviation. Makes sense in what way? Kate? It's easy to do a standard deviation. And it's also easy to find the what? The um, median. Median or average. Where's the average or the median on a bell curve? The middle. The middle. Everybody take a look. Okay, let's turn, turn the screen off. Locate for each of the distributions where the height of the bell curve is. Okay, so let's look at orange first. Orange is over here. Where's the height of that bell curve? Between seven and eight, yeah? Okay, how about this height of this red one right here? Nine to ten? Green one? It's like seven, eight. Blue one? Eight, nine. Eight, nine. And yellow one? Do you see any correlation between the highest element of the bell? And something else about those dice. The next ones are kind of the the next one. Say that again. The next bars out from yeah. the from the highest are also fairly tall. Yeah. Well, again, the the bell's gonna go like this, yeah. so you're gonna get quite a bit of area around that average. But just don't 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 cloud the highest bar too much yet, Megan. We're gonna get to that. I promise. That's next. But what do you notice about the highest bar compared to the overriding distribution? of the dice themselves. Look at what I've written above. I put orange, red, green, blue, and yellow. It's the average. It's the average of the distribution. So the highest bar on orange was the one that contained the average. The highest bar on red contained the average. The highest bar on green, the highest bar on blue, and the highest bar on yellow. Did that happen with the population graphs? I don't know. Let's, let, let's remind ourselves. Did that happen with the population graphs? Well, let's go back and look. There's the red one. Did it happen with the red one? The average was 9.2, it did. Yes. But that was already bell shaped. So we kind of knew it was gonna happen anyway. Did it happen with the orange one? Not even close. The orange one's average was seven. That's one of the shortest bars. But yet the sampling distribution's tallest bar contained the average. Here's green. It definitely happened with this one, but just by basis of symmetry. How about yellow? Did it happen with yellow? No, it's skewed. It's skewed, so the average is a little bit to the right of the highest bar. But yet, the sampling distribution highest bar caught it. And how about with blue? The average is 8.2, which is actually this bar right here, this kind of shorty in the middle. Mm -hmm. But look at the blue, the tallest bar here. It caught the average. Why are we excited about this? You're not excited about this. <laughs> Why am I excited about this? <laughs> Very good, Robert. Touche. <sighs> Point. Why am I excited about this? What's, what is the fiction I have written on the board up here? What is the fiction, statistically, that I have written on the board up here? On the board. Oh, I'm trying to include oh, okay. it. I've got some fiction written up on this board. Not with dice that you're holding in your hand, but suppose you want to know. We were talking about ADHD earlier. Suppose you want to know the proportion of ADHD kids in the population. JC? Okay, so <laughs> Go ahead. So when we did it, the mu... You, you just said it. That's the fiction. The fiction is this. Because if I want to know the proportion of ADHD kids in the population and has it changed over the past 20 years Even since diagnosis. Sample, if it doesn't show the population, population mm. That's the problem. That's you got it, JC. You had it. This is the fiction, friends. You're never going to know this in your population. I mean, we can know it here because I gave you the dice and you turned them and you counted all 36 outcomes. But you can't count every kid in America and measure them for ADHD and have it constantly update. You run out of funding, and or patients, and or time, and or all three. So what you do is you draw a sample, and you hope if your sample is done well enough, you'll get an idea of what mu is. Is that what happened here? Yes, on average, we got a good idea of what, even though we didn't know what mu was, the highest bar on the curves shows us where mu is. That makes me happy. A little bit happier, I'm just pinch. Still not happy. That's okay. <laughs> Statistically, it should make you <laughs> Statistically, it makes you happy because it means you can get on you can get accuracy. You can get accuracy with what you're trying to study with a sample. Even with a sample of only size four. Hell yeah, only size four. Now here's the problem I have. The problem I have is that there's quite a bit of wiggle room around that average in these graphs, isn't there? 
So for example, yes, the tallest bar in each of these distributions contains the average. But there are also lots of other bars, yes? And some of those bars are pretty far away from the average. Like look at the orange distribution over there. Yeah, 14 of the... Wait a minute, there should be more than that. We only had one group. Oh, it's only one group of orange? No, 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 uh, there was a snap food. Oh, data collections. That's 25. Okay, got it. I'm happier now. So that's 25 data. So anyway, 14, which is roughly two-thirds of the data, right? Two-thirds of the data contain the average. But then you've got these two that are over at five and six. Well, that's pretty far off the actual average. You're a couple points away. Red's the same way. You've got most 46 out of 75. So over half are type in. But then you've got these outliers on the sides. And the same thing with the green. And the same thing with the blue. You've got those tails out on the side. And then even yellow's got some tails. But here's the deal. You're always going to have that in a bell curve because that's they have outliers, yes? The question is, how far out are the outliers? Well, that's what I want to look at right now. Let's, let's grab, let's just go left to right with this one. Can you guys approximate? We know roughly, we know roughly what the average of this distribution is. And if you will, I'm going to call that something. I'm going to call that x bar bar. The average of all the x bars. Does, does that make sense? If I say, so x bar would be one of the x bars that you guys calculated of the 25. If I do x bar bar, that's like the average of all those averages. Does that kind of make sense? If I write this, are you guys happy with that statement? X bar bar is on average mu. That's, what we, that's, that's a mathematical equation that sums up what we just talked about for five minutes. We're targeting the average on average. Fair enough? Let me ask you this. What's the sample standard, de standard, de standard deviation of, of this curve? Ish. Ish, what is it? Could we approximate it? Now, I don't want you to grab your TIs. Could you approximate what the standard deviation is around this thing? I think we can. Check this out. This is a bell curve, yeah? Want to call that about 95% of the data? I mean, we're short some data. If we had more data, we'd have, we'd have a more full curve. So I'm just going to say that since this is a bell curve, I'm going to call this two standard deviations. Ballpark it, which goes from 5 up to 9. 5 up to 9, yes? 5 up to 9. That's a distance of 4. Okay? That's a distance of 4. We're doing some gorilla statistics here. That's gorilla with a U, not a no. So that's a distance of 4. The average would be basically right in the middle of that. Which means if I go out one standard deviation, I've gone out one each direction. And if I go out two, I've gone out one more to cover the four. Does that mean, and hopefully you guys will buy this, the, sta the sample standard deviation is going to be about one. Because you have to go one and then one more to cover the two standard deviations. Is, is, that, is that a fair, we haven't done this kind of mathematical standard deviation calculation in a while since we actually first learned about it. We've been kind of taking it for granted and just using it in general. <laughs> So do you see now how the sample standard deviation is less than the population standard deviation? Well, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. We have less variance around our data, which means, yes, on average, we're hitting the average. But there still is variance around the data. But the variance got less than in the population. That's good. Happy yet, Robert? Not as so happy yet. Which means we're missing the average, but we're missing it by less in the samples than we are on the actual population. Go, JC. Standard deviation is less than the sigma. Uh-huh. We're going to be more accurate. Like, what is more precise. That's a great word. JC just uttered a fantastic I'm going to come back to it on Thursday. We have a little more time. There's accuracy and there's precision. And we're going to talk about both of those in case you haven't learned those in other classes. We'll talk about it on Thursday. This guarantees accuracy. In other words, our, our rifle is calibrated to hit the target. The problem is we've got this wideness of our, of our shot pattern. This means our shot pattern is tighter than that because it's less variant from the center. Fair enough. Let's see if it carries in general, though. Let's see if I can make Robert happy. Mm, good, luck. <laughs> good luck. Here we go. Here we go. Here's the red curve. Here's the red curve. Yes? Here's the red curve. Now, this has got more data points in it. So what I'm going to do, with your permission, I'm going to call those the outliers, the extremes of that curve. We, we would have had more of those on the orange curve as well. I'm going to call this two standard deviations right here. So that goes from 8 to 11, which is a distance of 3, yeah? It's a distance of 3. That means the sample standard deviation should be about 3 divided by 4, or 0.75. It should be about 0.75. I cut it in fourths, just like we did over here, divided by 4. Now again, 
it's less than sigma. So once again, we got more precision, JC. Good. Let's see if it keeps holding up. Let's see if it keeps holding up. I almost guarantee it's going to hold up here because that curve was so spread out. Do you remember? The green curve was such a widespread curve. So I'll chop the outs again and count this as your, this is your uh, again, I'm just trying to fit a bell to the data. Okay, so five to nine, that's got a standard deviation of about one. Even if you were to pump them out even further, it's going to be less than 2.92, which is almost three. Even if you were to include these guys in there, you're still going to have a smaller. And that's going to hold all along for every single curve, isn't it? Every single sampling distribution dist uh, curve has a smaller sigma. Every single one, 11 to 5 is a distance of 6, divided by 4 is 1.5, yes? Every single one is less than the population standard deviation. So three things that are really cool are happening right now. Number one, the damn bell curve. Number one, the damn bell curve. That's pretty cool. Number two, the height of the bell curve is where? The, or the highest point of the bell curve is where? On mu, which we don't know. Which means, on average, we're getting a look at the population center. Why do we care about that? Say that again, JC. Because if we're taking a sample of it, it tells us. That tells us something useful. Yes, we can apply it. I know that if my, if my sample comes back and tells me the percentage you're looking for is 26%, the population parameter is probably pretty close to 26%. But then it's got some wiggle. Because we can be off, yes? We can be off to on one side of the other, uh, 26. But what do we just notice with a sample of size 4? What happens to the offness? It gets more precise. So what do you think? And we'll come back to this on Thursday. What do you think about making precision better? What should we do? Use bigger samples. Yes. Yes, use bigger samples. And that's what we're going to do, not with these dice on Thursday, because it gets too tedious. I set up an Excel spreadsheet that will let the samples grow up to 100 or larger. And we'll analyze that in class together on Thursday. And you'll start to see what happens. And it's predictable, which is actually kind of slick. Okay, don't. So, if you would be so kind, no homework for next time. No homework. Just knock your project out. And there's a quiz posted if you want to do it. By all means, knock that out too. Um, and if you can return my dice, that'd be awesome. My lovely handcrafted dice. Thank you. And make a pile of your quizzes. Yes. You got some take home, or you got some in class quizzes in a little pile? Yes. Get you some points for it. Uh, and we'll see you on Thursday. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, Michael.